Hello everyone, bonjour tout le monde. Je m'appelle Camille Ferrier et je suis la gestionnaire des communications et de l'adhésion des membres à la Fédération des sciences humaines. The Federation for the Humanities and Social Sciences is the national voice for over 90,000 researchers in Canada, with a membership comprising over 160 universities and scholarly associations. I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, Build Your Research Impact. To begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Federation Office and most of the staff are located on unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe Nation. Federation staff, speakers, and audience members for today's webinar are participating from across the country. And so we also extend our respect to all First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples for their valuable past and present contribution to this land. Just a few housekeeping notes before we start. Today's webinar will take place in English and simultaneous interpretation in French is available. Click on the little globe at the bottom of your screen to enable it. Closed captioning is available in English and French. To turn the English captions off, click Live Live Transcript and select Hide. For French closed captioning, please click on the link provided in the Zoom chat box. Merci à toutes et à tous pour votre présence aujourd'hui. The Federation is committed to promoting the valuable and diverse contributions of humanities and social sciences scholars across Canada. We advance the national dialogue on the societal impact of humanities and social sciences research, and we support humanities and social sciences scholars in assessing, communicating, and growing their research impact. Today's webinar, Build Your Research Impact, directly comes out of this work. What knowledge mobilization tools are right for your project? How can you expand the reach of your research through critical community engagement? How do you better communicate your research to non-specialist audiences? Those are some of the questions that we will cover today. We are honored to have three outstanding panelists joining us to this conversation. Connie Tang from Research Impact Canada, Dr. Liz Jackson from the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute at the University of Guelph, and Vinita Srivastava from the Conversation Canada in the Don't Call Me Resilient podcast. Each panelist will give a short presentation, followed by a period of questions and answers and discussion. You can submit your questions at any time by typing them into the question and answer box. This webinar is part of our ongoing Career Corner series, which brings professional development workshops to our humanities and social sciences community. I would like to thank our series partner and sponsor, University Affairs, Affaires Universitaires, for their continued support. I will now give the floor to our moderator, Hannah Pavek, who will introduce our first panelist. Hannah, c'est à toi. Thank you, Camille, and hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Pavic, the policy lead here at the Federation, and I'm delighted to be introducing our first panelist, Connie Tang, who will be giving us an introduction to Research Impact and her work with Research Impact Canada. Connie Tang is the manager of Research Impact Canada. She leads the knowledge mobilization portfolio for Canada's skills, education, and training sector with the Future Skills Centre, and supports RIC's national and bilingual network of 18 plus universities. She comes from a strong research, education, and facilitation background and worked provincially and federally in capacity building, stakeholder engagement, relationship management, and knowledge translation activities to identify and test solutions for workforce and skills development. Connie completed her Master of Science at the University of Toronto in Chemistry, touching on energy and conservation management. She serves on the Board of Directors for the Toronto Region Conservation Authority. Through volunteer work, she's an active advocate for women, seniors, and newcomers to Canada in the Scarborough community, and volunteers as a career mentor with Toronto Region Immigrant Employment Council. So thank you so much, Connie, for being with us today. Over to you. Fabulous, thank you so much. And it is such a pleasure to be here. Merci beaucoup. 
Um, and I'm so excited to be speaking to you today. I'm going to start sharing my screen um, here. I will be using something today called Menti, which is basically if you happen to be looking at this presentation on your laptop and you have a smartphone or an iPad or a tablet handy beside you, you're welcome to go to the uh, open your browser on your smartphone and go to menti.com and enter the code uh, 89848612. Totally optional, even if you don't do this or you don't have a smartphone handy, all good. You'll be able to participate anyway, but Menti will allow you to, I have some questions and you can interact with the presentation a little bit. So with that, uh, like Hannah said, thank you so much again for inviting me. My name is Connie, um, Manager of Research at Canada. Um, I come from York University, so I'll just start off with a quick not land acknowledgement from York. We recognize that many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of York University. York University acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been caretaken by the Anishinaabeg Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. We acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This territory is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peacefully share and care for the Great Lakes region. So we're all here today to talk about impact. And so this is where the first Menti question comes along, which I want to ask you and hear from you and hear from the folks here on this call, which is what does making an impact mean to you? So if you happen to have your smartphone handy, again, your tablet handy, um, it's at the top of the screen there. You can go to menti.com and use the code 89848612 and type in a couple words as to what does impact mean to you. If you don't want to use Menti, but you still want to participate, but Menti is not available to you and you don't have a smartphone handy, feel free to type it into the Zoom chat. All good. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the people here that are contributing, um, you know, what does making an impact mean to you? I think what we're seeing, we see meaningful change, co-creation, research into action, demonstrable change for society. You see so much change, impact. And I think really what we're hearing and what we're seeing is that impact is creating a difference beyond the research. And I think that's why we're all here and why we're all interested um, in this webinar here today. So that's fabulous. I think we all want to achieve impact, but how do you get there? What is, how do we achieve this? And knowledge mobilization is one of the pathways we can use to achieve impact. So I show this diagram here. This is a diagram that my boss, David Phipps, Assistant Vice President of Research Strategy and Impact at York University, uses this diagram to make the connection between you know, what we want to achieve, which is research impact, and the how, which is knowledge mobilization. So I'll stay on this diagram a little bit, so bear with me here. But you'll see two circles on the left-hand side. You have campus and you have community. And in a diagram like this, I think community tends to refer to likely a lot of the folks on this call here today. We're talking about social sciences and humanities students, researchers, faculty, you know, and in my, you know, in an academic, research environment, these people tend to be situated on campus. Now there's another circle here up top called community in quotation marks. And I put it in quotation marks because community encompasses the stakeholders of your project or the stakeholders of your research. So this could be anything from maybe government bodies, let's say municipal, provincial, or federal entities, nonprofits, local community partners, or industry they tend not to necessarily sit on, you know, our academic campuses as we know it. And so we put that, so they're kind of in that separate circle. I think that there's often a misconception that knowledge mobilization is only and exclusively about making research more accessible and usable and relevant to community. Now that's definitely part of it, but it's not all of it because that implies that there's just this one way relationship between you know, your knowledge producers or the folks that sit on your campus, your researchers or your students and your knowledge users, you know, your 
you're making that research more relevant, more actionable to that community piece and those knowledge users. And the reason why I say it's a misconception is because I think knowledge globalization encompasses more than that. Knowledge globalization is really, it's not this one way relationship between campus to community, but it's actually an opportunity to create a shared space between the two these two circles, these two entities. And so that kind of brings us to the middle of this diagram here, where in this shared space, between campus and community or between your knowledge users and your knowledge producers or between your researchers and your community stakeholders, whatever that, whoever those entities may be, it's the shared space to create an opportunity for maybe knowledge transfer or ideally knowledge exchange where you're finding complementary expertise where campus can learn from community and community can learn from campus. When this happens, I, hopefully you have some, you know, you have co-production, which is where you're working together on a mutual goal to serve mutual interests for, for, benef for benefit to everyone. And sometimes when this happens, impact is then created. So while I think there's often a metaphor of knowledge mobilization being just the thing that bridges the gap, I think that bridges the gap implies that you still have community and campus as these two separate entities. And I think closing the loop might be a better metaphor for it because it really, again, emphasizes that knowledge mobilization is about connecting research to community for mutual benefit. So with that, I think that there's um, you know, more questions about, great, sounds good, knowledge mobilization, tell us more. What do we do? And so here, this is again something um, that we talk a lot about at York University, but it extends is now it now extends well beyond York University, and many organizations uses this pathway, which is called the co-produced pathway to impact. I've linked the um, link to the paper down below that you're welcome to check out. And what I really kind of want to highlight is that. These, there's these two circles here. You have your researcher space and this co-production partner. And in the shared space are where the stages of, you know, the pathway to knowledge, sorry, the knowledge mobilization pathway can happen. And so you have research, dissemination, uptake, implementation. Research might be where a lot of you sit, maybe not, I'm not sure. Uh, but it tends to be people who are generating new knowledge and new evidence, or maybe they're creating a new program. Dissemination is, I think, maybe something that I, for one, was the most familiar with before entering this space, because I really related to publishing my research and presenting at panels and workshops and, you know, writing a blog post about it or having social media strategy. But what I've learned is that dissemination and communication is incredibly important, but it is, and it is incredibly necessary, but it's not sufficient in order to actually create impact, to create change, to change behavior, to generate action, all those things that folks had said in that first uh, slide there. So in order to do that, there needs to be an uptake and implementation piece. And these are kind of the two buckets that the facilitation of the context of your research is incredibly important because context allows, you know, for both the people that you're trying to reach to be able to see themselves in it more actionable, more relevant to them, but also see themselves as participants within it and to co-produce hopefully an implementation program or research question with the academic partner. The thing that I will highlight here um, specifically is the stakeholder engagement line at the very bottom where you see it in green. And you see that stakeholder engagement runs at every single stage of this pathway. And the reason for that is because stakeholder engagement is incredibly important. It doesn't just occur at uptake and implementation stages if, or dissemination stages. It starts at research. It starts when you're generating your research project, when you're generating those questions. And as you embark on the research project, it's, it, it continues with dissemination and communications, making sure that you're targeting your audiences appropriately, that you're giving them a message that they care about and they want to hear. 
uptake, that it's something that they can use and it's something that it really gives context and how they could use this information and apply this and then implementation, hopefully then where this could be put into practice and put into action. So this, with this, I'd love for to hear from you guys. And again, through menti.com, using that same code at the top of the slide there, for you to rank which stage of the pathway interests you most. Maybe it's the pathway, maybe it's a stage of the pathway that you're most familiar with. Maybe it's the stage of the pathway that you happen to be working in. Um, but I'd love for you to, to start ranking, you know, where you see yourselves or what interests you. Wonderful, thank you. So we're seeing, I think, a lot of folks, research and impact planning uh, comes at the top pretty consistently, and we're seeing quite a few changes for, for the other buckets here. I will move on for the sake of time to now show you a couple of tools that Research Impact Canada has both have both curated as well as created um, around each of the stage of the pathway. We'll start off with research and planning. And so here we, we saw that that was the one that generated the most interest, which is fabulous. So if you happen to identify yourself most as working in the research and planning space right now in regards to your project or your research, and you wanna know more about how do I incorporate, you know, knowledge realization practices in my project so that it's something I'm thinking all throughout the process, then we have some fabulous planning templates here um, to show you. I don't know if you see my cursor, but it's a third bullet point here. And if you want to have just more information on how do I guide my research questions, how do I ensure that the things that I'm doing maybe, you know, always loop back and think back to that impact piece, then these first two links here, an impact literacy workbook and this questions checklist um, called Guiding Principles for Broader Impact um, will be fabulous resources for you. And there's a bunch of other links here as well. If what you're really interested in is in dissemination and communications, because we're all about the tools here today, um, I wanted to highlight a couple specifically in this area. So we have a disseminating findings checklist and guide from Cochrane that is truly, truly fabulous. It has a one page checklist. You know, are you targeting your audiences? How is your context stru content structured? Um, are you using plain language? Are you incorporating the end users? And there's a one page checklist of this guide. And then there's kind of a hundred page PDF that accompanies it that breaks down each line of that checklist into some tangible steps or things you can consider in order to be able to achieve that check on that list. There's a checklist from on plain language writing from Sick Kids that is a fabulous tool. Again, ensuring that the language that you're using is language that is easy to understand and applicable. And the one that's closest and nearest to my heart is um, an e-learning module that Research About Canada designed um, on infographic design. You will not be a graphic designer after taking this module, okay? I, that's not a promise I can make. However, if you're totally new to graphic design or infographics, this will give you a little bit of the basics, give you some design principles, as well as some kind of, you know, data visualization principles, and you will have an opportunity to make your own infographic at the end of this e-learning module. And again, some other resources there. I will... Uh, move on quickly with uh, with our time running low here. So uptake, we have some really great guides, again, e-learning modules around event planning and knowledge brokering, as well as implementation, which is really focused on, you know, fostering those research collaborations, building those successful partnerships, and enabling community-based research in that kind of shared space co-produced way. Last but not least, I will mention also evaluation because it's important to know, you know, if we're doing it, how effective is it? How can we measure this? And so we have a toolkit that is around knowledge engagement that was developed by the University of Calgary. Um, they, I think engagement and stakeholder engagement is really hard to put tangible metrics and ways to measure that. And so this toolkit gives you some guidance as to how to do that, as well as kind of, you know, a weighted Excel to kind of get you started. 
and as well as a webinar by the really fabulous Sarah Morton, um, who's a really fantastic evaluator in this knowledge realization space, talking about, you know, how do we know if research and knowledge realization make a difference? Now, if you were like, all these tools sound great, I want to know all of them. Here's the one link you need to know, resources.researchimpact.ca. On this page, all these tools that I mentioned and more and many others can be found on this one site. We're actually going to be revamping the site for January, but the link here will stay the same. You're welcome to access it. And with that, I wanted to say thank you from Research Impact Canada. I'll just tell you kind of a one minute brief on who we are. We are a network of now 23 universities and one non-university member, which is Ontario Shores, a mental health hospital. And after 15 years, we have built now a really robust network that has presence across nine out of 10 provinces in Canada. And we are really focused on building that institutional capacity in knowledge mobilization. But really, it's a national community of practice for knowledge mobilization. So we mutually share tools, learnings, and best practices. Me and my team, we sometimes create tools. We sometimes generate webinars and stuff. But also, we invite our membership to also be actively involved, actively engaged, and also share their learnings with us. We have some really fantastic specialties in knowledge mobilization, including but not limited to institutional strategy, engagement in rural and rural communities, you know, creating certifications and micro-credentialing, and local and community partnerships. So with that, um, I will end it there. Thank you very much for, for listening and, the, and inviting me to this panel. My email is on the slide, tangc at yorku.ca. You're welcome to email me if you want to continue this conversation. I love talking about this stuff. And thank you very much. Thank you, Connie. That was fantastic. Um, really great to see all those resources. I loved the way that you talked through the visualization of Pathways to Impact. That was uh, really helpful. Um, and really great to see a lot of conversation in the chat as well. Um, I'd also encourage you, if you do have any questions for Connie and for our other panelists, to put it in the Q&A box because um, that's where we're going to be looking um, for questions at the end of the presentations. Um, but now it's a real pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Liz Jackson, who will dive into this question of community engagement. Dr. Liz Jackson is director of the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute at the University of Guelph. Uh, SESI is a research and teaching support unit that brokers and sustains community university partnerships and supports collaborative research that addresses community identified research priorities. Building on her expertise in critical community engaged scholarship, critical pedagogy, practice based research and art based community making, Liz provides leadership and strategic direction to SESI and supports staff members in the development and implementation of all programs. With community faculty and student collaborators, the SESI team works to facilitate mutually beneficial community university partnerships that create research impact towards positive social change. Currently, Liz is working to more deeply integrate anti-oppressive commitments into the unit's programs and practices, um, and really looking forward to hearing more about that. Thank you, Liz. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Hannah. It's, it's really fun to be here. Like Connie, I love talking about my work. Um, so I will look forward to sharing with you all. Uh, before we start, just a quick note that I am in Hamilton at the end of Lake Ontario, and I work at the University of Guelph. Uh, so both places that are on dish with one spoon uh, territory and part of the two row wampum agreement. And it's a, a pleasure and an honor to be working here. So I'm Liz and as Hannah said, I direct the Community Engaged Scholarship Institute. You may hear me calling us SESI. So we are a research and teaching support unit that is mandated to um, support, implement and develop others capacity for community university partnered research. Um, this happens across a range of programs, including uh, course-based community-engaged research, um, paid graduate research, assistantship, uh, research assistantships, um, and across a range of other programs that you're welcome to snoop at our website on this slide. 
Um, I'm here today to talk about how community engaged research is one of many methods that can work to support and ensure um, and deepen research impact. Um, and also to talk, as Hannah mentioned, about how we are seeking to use our work to support broader anti-oppressive uh, work and struggles for social justice. Let's see if I can make my slides work. So at SESI, um, we our work is informed by principles first, and then the methods flow from those. So our work is built on the knowledge that our research will be most impactful when it's designed, implemented, and thus already wanted by um, and created indeed by knowledge users who are our collaborators. Um, we recognize that all members of a collaboration are knowledge holders, as Connie was saying uh, really beautifully just now. Um, and so we're exchanging and building with our shared expertise, skills, and knowledges, rather than the, the kind of conventional charitable model of me solving a problem for the needy community. Um, that, that's been very well put to rest by Connie, so I won't belabor that point. Um, so we don't have that kind of struggle to disseminate our research findings uh, because we're, the whole process is a process of exchange and building and knowledge dissemination. We do, however, work very hard to increase um, the reach of our research findings beyond our own collaborations. And so for that reason, we work similarly um, to make sure that there are clear language reports of all our, of all our projects, as well as potentially journal manuscripts, presentations to boards of directors, educational materials, and so on. Um, and everything's freely available in our library's atrium and through our website. So I've already talked a little bit about our mandate. I will move along. So here are some key terms that will help you to understand the shifts we're trying to make at SESI. Um, so community engaged scholarship, many of you will be familiar with the sort of um, conventional, I guess, the, the, the main, the most popular definition. So CES or community engaged scholarship involves a mutually beneficial partnership between researchers and community members. Again, we don't really believe those two are discrete groups, but this is how we explain our work to ourselves. So crucially, mutual doesn't have to mean the same. So for a research staff member, you know, one of the benefits might be that it helps you to move toward your goal of tenure, as I saw someone talking about in the chat. And that's fine if the project collaboration is also a benefit to your collaborators in ways that meet their needs. And as long as there's no kind of um, exploitation or, or harm in the mix. So we don't need to all want the same things, but we do need to orient ourselves around the same questions. Um, it results in scholarship, and I've already talked about a range of potential outfits. Um, outputs that come from the process of teaching, discovery, knowledge exchange, and, and co-creation. Um, and largely speaking, research and knowledge mobilization are taken up with a goal of impacting the public good. And I will, I'll pin that and return to that in a minute. So since I took on the director role in um, 2017, um, we have worked as a team at SESI to be more explicitly committed to what we are calling after Cynthia Gordon de Cruz, um, who's cited down below, critical community engaged scholarship, which is a form of um, engaged scholarship that is committed to addressing systemic um, forces behind social inequities and challenges. It's informed by anti-racist and other anti-oppressive theories. It is firmly asset-based in terms of its um, understanding of community and communities. Um, and we seek to mobilize knowledge in ways that serve justice um, deserving communities and initiatives. Um, so just, just as a quick example of what a project might look like under each of these frames. Um, for example, if I were a researcher um, interested in helping a food pantry to understand its service provision and impacts, um, we would try to understand, maybe we could craft a research questionnaire seeking to understand who are the community members they are reaching um, and thus to kind of understand where they're not yet having reached an impact. So the public good is served because we help a service organization to reach more people who are in need of access to food. In a CCES partnership, we would seek also to understand, for example, the ways in which intersection, in, intersection, intersecting um, identities and social factors are creating food inequities in the first place. Or we might try to look at the experiences of people when they arrive at the food pantry, our, our signs and and um, labels appropriate to their levels of literacy and their, their linguistic um, use. For example, um, are people experiencing barriers to participation based on their immigration status, their disability, their gender and sexual, uh, sexual identities? 
So the difference is really that we take a systemic approach. So we're still answering the question about who are we reaching and how can we reach them better? We're also gathering knowledge and learning that help us to also mobilize our learning to eradicate food insecurity. Does that make sense? Okay, I'll move on. So this is, this is the CCES wheel as we practice it at SESI, and it's gonna look quite familiar to many of you who have done collaborative research. I won't belabor it. Um, I do want to say briefly um, before I go on that everything we're doing at SESI um, is informed and led by activism and community organizing. So those are the practices, those are the critical practices, those are the practices of care, those are the practices of education and capacity development that inspire the work that we do from our location at the edge of a campus. So we're, we're kind of a bridging organization. Um, I do think that it's important though to not, not let ourselves think that community engagement is some brilliant academic invention. It's in fact a, an academic methodology that arose as academics sought to align their work in one place with the priorities work and organizing happening um, already in other, in other movements. And it's an honor to be able to try to play some small part in that work. So Connie already did away with the conventional model where we only, we only connect with stakeholders or knowledge users at the end when we've brilliantly discovered something and we need to share it out. Um, I also agree that that's not a, a super productive or impactful model. Um, so through the, through the wheel that we've got here, you know, this is kind of a typical research cycle. We'll meet or be referred to a community partner or organization or grassroots network um, that's seeking to understand better something. Um, we'll do info gathering. And this doesn't just mean, you know, what, what are your stats, but you learn deeply each other's cultures and organizations. So what's your funding structure? How are you governed? What are conventional um, expectations of your role? What's your actual social change goal? What are the challenges and barriers? What language do you use? How do I talk to your director when I go pitch with you for funding? Then we'll scope and broker a project, um, agreeing on, you know, in terms of our capacities and time and so on, what we're going to ask and how we're going to, um, how we're going to implement. So the implementation really means a flexible but very clear work plan um, that sketches out people's roles and responsibilities, the phases of the project. This is of course a living document. So as step five is happening and a SESI staff member or a faculty member or a graduate student or whoever it is, is leading their part of the research and the community collaborators leading their part of the research, there's a constant um, making sure that, that uh, priorities are honored, keeping in touch, booking check-in meetings, um, and thus the implementation planning sometimes is a living document that has to flex a little bit because reality is never as smooth as we hope it will be. And then really crucially, especially in the um, commitment to anti-oppressive practice and critical practice, there's always a really important wrap up and debrief. So the, the project may, might be over, but the process is not. And this is when we need to constantly and throughout, and particularly at the end, we have to look very frankly at ourselves, our project, um, how did power operate in this space? What were challenges we didn't anticipate? What were, what were successes we didn't anticipate? So here's an example of a project that I'm gonna try to briefly show you how it shifted it between phase one and phase two from a CES project to a project that is more explicitly critically community engaged. So in 2017, right when I was brand new in my job, um, a friend of a friend, basically a contact of a contact reached out to me on behalf of a group of five social service organizations that support um, youth living with multiple disabilities. And so these youth are users of social services, often under the name community living, but they do have other organizational names. So this powerhouse group of managers of services at these five groups across Ontario had come together um, in the years previously to identify a crucial research priority, which was in the face of polit policy changes that cut youth off from, uh, from youth services right when they turned uh, age of majority, they really needed to understand what were the needs and experiences of youth who were just dropped completely from youth care with no transition planning. So they had created already their research questions, carried out their interviews, um, and they were coming to, to us because the, the, the researcher they were working with was no longer able to continue the work. So we kind of stepped in as their academic partner. And what we did was support their um, integrated knowledge mobilization planning from that point onward. We led the data analysis with um, feedback loops with the organizing team, the collaborating team. And then we created in the end two outputs, a policy brief for policy makers, uh, ministry representatives and so on, and an education brief that was intended to target both 
transitional age youth themselves, service providers and uh, caregivers and friends of, of TAYS, they call them. So that was pretty good. I mean, we presented together, um, we, we met our goals, we learned a lot and the participants felt quite seen and affirmed. And we know because we're still in relationship that people have made changes to their practices at the very ground level in trying to set youth up for better transitions. But we stayed friends and we hung out more and we had a chance luckily to come back together, uh, my colleague and I, my colleague from Community Living, and we pitched to um, a board of directors. So directors of all the Southwestern Ontario social service orgs, we wanted project funding to do phase two. So we went together and we, we made our case that we now need to do phase two and we need to understand the needs of adults who have transitioned out of youth services and are now living in community accessing only adult supports. Um, it went really well, they were very supportive. So we have now gone back through the cycle and in the time between the first cycle, which was quite hurried and just jumping in, and then um, CECI have been, have been doing a lot of work. We've been doing a lot of work to understand how to more deeply and intentionally integrate principles of CCEF around this wheel. So we started as though we hadn't met before. Um, we came together uh, warmly. There were new staff members at, at both sides. There were new student team members. We got to know each other again. What's changed? What are your priorities? This whole pandemic thing happened during the middle. What did that do for your funding structures? And we went through the whole scoping, brokering, planning, uh, project management support uh, process. So that's where we're sitting now. And crucially, I wanna just quickly share with you, I, I can share links after the presentation as well. So this again comes from Gordon de Cruz, who's really been quite an influential theorist um, and activist it, for us at SESI. So she offers in her article about critical community engaged scholarship, four questions that she says might help, help to keep people on track as we're trying to work in anti-oppressive ways. So one, are we collaboratively developing critically conscious knowledge? Are we authentically locating expertise? Are we conducting race conscious versus supposedly race value research and scholarship? Which means are we taking seriously the ways in which uh, racialized identity does affect people's lived experiences rather than pretending that understanding all food pantry users is the same as understanding food pantry users by various uh, markers of identity. And then four, is our work grounded in asset-based understandings of community? So with all those questions and many more in our heads, we've planned a phase two that looks quite a bit different than phase one. So we have kept the collaborative model. We have a steering committee still led by managers and directors of service providing organizations. Uh, but we have added peer researchers to the mix. And so peer researchers are people with lived expertise who have themselves experienced the transition from youth to adult services. These are crucial voices in the mix because um, the first phase we really only engaged with service providers. This time we're engaging with service providers and people who are users of those services. Uh, it's changing the way we ask questions. It's changing the way we're gonna structure our interviews and focus groups. And it's going to make the research so much more robust. Um, we've also added a much slower, a much slower process. So instead of, instead of trying to get it done, um, we have built a deliberately very long timeline. And again, we have the luxury and privilege in this case of good funding, um, both from my unit and from uh, the groups of community living. Um, we've also added sections to the interviews and surveys that were not present in phase one that both collect demographic data so that if there are differences to be found across racialized uh, gender, sexuality, visibility, status, and so on, we will at least be able to see if they're there. Um, and we've also added questions and prompt in the interviews and focus groups that ask people to uh, reflect and share if they want to on how they think that their identities have affected their access to services and their journeys through the system. So, this, I hope, gives a bit of a grounded example of what I mean when I say CCES. I'm going to cut myself off there because I think I'm pretty much through my 10 minutes, if not more so. Looks like Thank it. You. Thank you so much, Liz. That was Very welcome. fascinating. Um, really appreciate you inviting us to kind of critically reflect on how to approach community engagement. Uh, those guiding questions as well is something that I I think um, would be great to, to share more widely too, because um, yeah, very, very interesting. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled to, to introduce our, our final panelist for today, Vanita Srivastava. 
Benita will take us through how to communicate your research to non-specialist audiences and engage media. So we're moving from the community engagement to a more media perspective, but I think some of the threads will definitely be taken up there. Uh, Vanita Srivastava is the producer and host of Don't Call Me Resilient, a podcast that takes on the ways racism permeates our everyday lives. She's also the senior editor of the Culture and Society Desk at The Conversation Canada. Vanita is an accomplished journalist, educator, and media innovator with experience in South Asia, South Africa, Rwanda, the US, and Canada. She has reported and edited for the New York Times Magazine, Vibe, The Village Voice, and Savoy. She co-hosted the Asia Pacific Forum at WBIA Radio and Masala Misk at, at CKLN for over a decade. And she has taught media for NGOs internationally and at the Ryerson School of Journalism as a professor of journalism. So thank you, Vanita, for joining us. I will pass it over to you. Thanks, Anna. It's great to be here. I'm going to just give me a moment while I figure out how to share my screen. Um, and I go to my full. There we go. So thanks, both of you, Connie and Liz. I've learned so much already. And it's one of the things I love about my job at The Conversation is that I'm constantly learning um, from people like you and from the academic community. Um, we are the place to go for fact-based journalism. Um, it's an honor and a privilege to be doing this work every single day. Um, as Hannah said, I'm the senior editor for culture and society. So I'm mostly going to be speaking about um, that section. And I can talk a little bit about the podcast, Don't Call Me Resilient, which um, we've just finished season two today. So um, it's very exciting for me to talk about that as well. So we are, what's our mission? We are a team in Canada. Well, we are actually one of a large global network. So we, um, the conversations are, um, is across the globe. The Conversation US and the Conversation UK are our English partners, Australia as well. Um, and our mission is to share knowledge. Um, it is fact-based knowledge. It's science-based knowledge. Um, oh, sorry, did I miss, did I? Oh, here we are. <laughs> so what we do is we take um, scholars, academics, and we are plus journalists. We are a group of mission-driven journalists, I would say, across the country. Um, it's really an honor to be working with everybody. Um, we have basically 500 republishers across the globe. And everything that we publish is Creative Commons. So what that means is, that any article that we publish can be picked up and republished in places like um, coming from the city of Toronto. I'm just gonna mention the Global Mail, the Toronto Star, McLean's, um, Canadian Press. Those are the kinds of places that will take up our articles and recirculate them. CBC, um, Global News. Um, as you can imagine, our model of journalism was really in high demand during the, the height of the pandemic. Our audience has grown so much. And that's partly, as you, you, you can imagine, because I'm sure yourselves, just like me, were out there hunting for news that we can trust. And one of the issues that has happened in Canada, but across North America, is tragically that um, our specialists, our specialist journalists, the, the, the funding has really decreased. So we don't have those specialist desks anymore. And so when we pick up a, a media, you know, we pick up a news story, we really, we, I think audiences feel really differently when they pick up a conversation articles. They know that that article is written by an expert, often somebody who's been researching that issue for more than a decade. So this is just a quick overview of who our audience is. So in Canada, one of the greatest, one of the great things for a Canadian researcher is to know that 40% of our audience is from the US. So it is a good opportunity to, to get your research out, not just to a Canadian audience, we do want to do that, but to get it out to a US audience and, and across the globe as well. And we have these, I'm going to show you a little bit later in this presentation, a beautiful back end of our website. So if you do write for us and you want to see exactly 
where your article is going, who's reading it, who's picking it up. You can take a look and it'll tell you actually 6% of this article is being picked up in India or in Australia. So as you know, I'm the culture and society desk, but I work with a team of really amazing editors who are coming from all kinds of places. So um, science editor, health editor, we all have um, a politics editor who's been um, doing politics reporting and editing for uh, decades. So we all come from our own areas of expertise. And the special thing about, I would say the special thing about us is that as journalists, we really work hand in hand. It's really a collaborative process. So we work hand in hand with scholars to try and get that article out to the most amount of readers possible. And to do that, we're doing some of the things that, you know, Connie had mentioned, and I think Liz also talked about is, you know, common language, make sure that the language is accessible. Um, but we're also, you know, it's it's a little bit a step beyond that because what we're trying to do is make sure that that's a journalistic article so that that article that we're producing can get recirculated and picked up by all these other news organizations. And that comes with a very specific style. Um, I, I was just, I, sometimes, uh, so, as you know, we're, our model is based on authors who really know what they're talking about. Um, all of our scholars, all of our writers must be currently um, a researcher, a PhD student, um, a university professor, adjunct, et cetera, but you must um, be at, attached to a research institution in Canada. So this is a great, uh, thing to talk about is is that my like, I'll give you an example of this um, how in what happens after some authors publish with us so one of the things this is a little survey that we did with the authors and the authors will tell us well actually I wrote with you I wrote and I published my article in the conversation and after I did that I immediately got invited to go to a global conference so there was a question earlier about the pre-tenure you know those those folks who are pre-tenure who may be worried about taking some time away. I don't know if this is this is true, but you may be worried about taking time away from working on those peer-reviewed publications, those all-important peer-reviewed publications, that thinking that perhaps taking the day or the 10 hours or the eight hours or the four hours to write a news article or a popular article may not be as important for the tenure review committee. But these are some examples of why some of the information or some of that work that you do is actually important um, pre-tenure as well, is it does get you, does get your name out there and it does get your work out there. Um, you get, you know, noticed on, on panels or invited to panels that you may not be invited to. This is uh, Nadia Nafi, who talks a little bit about her impact and how she, you know, same kind of thing. She started writing with us when she was a PhD student, and now she's assistant professor, you can see. And, you know, she talks about the impact of her research and how she sort of compares, well, I did this peer review published article and it got me you know, I don't know, 500 views, and I did this article for the conversation and it's being really circulated and shared. And, and that's a pleasure uh, for some people, and it's also a real comment on the impact of your work. So culture and society, which is where I'm at, I work with Haley Lewis, who um, specializes in looking at Indigenous research. She connects with Indigenous academics and researchers, um, sharing our work with a larger audience. Um, one of the things that was a real pleasure for me when I started working at the conversation was that I got to contact people that I considered 
to be rock stars, you know, they're like the rock star academics. So for me, that might be somebody like Daniel Justice at UBC or Yasmin Jawani at Concordia or Christina Sharp. These are, you know, these are the voices that I was really seeking out. I really wanted to extend the coverage of, I really wanted to fill in the gaps that I knew existed in mainstream media. And I really turned to a lot of um, scholars and academics to help me do that. So here's a couple of examples of stories that we've published recently. Um, you can immediately go if you want to see some more of our stories, um, theconversation.com. If you're watching from somewhere else outside of Canada, you would go to conversation.com and just look at the drop down menu for Canada. So again, the idea of why write, I talked about the analytics that you get, you get to really see not only where are people reading your article, but who's tweeting it, you know, where are their shape way, where are they sharing it, are they sharing it on Facebook. Um, and uh, often I hear I not I've heard from a, a, a many people, many scholars who've told me that they've used those analytics to then apply for grants um, when to, for knowledge mobilization grants. Okay, here is an example of what it looks like when you sign on. So one of the things that you can immediately do if you're interested in writing for the conversation is you go to theconversation.com. On the right-hand side, it says sign up to be an author. And on the right-hand side, um, once you sign up to be an author, you'll be taken to the back end of our website. You immediately become basically a member of our staff. You have access to this analytical board. So Thomas Merritt, who's professor of chemistry and biochemistry at Laurentian University, has written many, has written a lot for us. You can see his readership is over a million. He's got over a million views. This is not necessarily typical, um, but his articles have done really, really well. And you can see on the right hand side, it says, you know, where his readers are coming from. There's a little chart here. I don't know if you can see my. Um, there's the United States, um, Canada's here, New Zealand, and it tells you um, other, there'll be a more detailed breakdown if you scroll down, but this is a screenshot, so I can't, um, I can't show you that. So this is the question that I always get asked is, how do I know what to pitch? What makes a good story? Um, so these are some of the things about what makes a good story. Uh, you know, are you the kind of person who's you're sitting there, you're watching the news or you're reading the news and you think, well, actually, I have something to say about this particular event. This thing happened. Um, my research is connected to it. My area of expertise is connected to it. That's always a great um, moment to pitch your idea and pitch your story. Um, does it draw on new research that's about to be published? Um, like an example here is um, not to say that we that we really want to dredge up this story again, but uh, Trudeau and his, the old photos of him in blackface. So that was an uh, that was an opportunity for any researcher in Canada. Um, one example is Cheryl Thompson to pick pick up that story it's it's got a, a it linked to her you know her decades of research on blackface in canada it's the perfect time for her to think about how can i connect my research to the story that's ongoing or that's just come out um, does it draw on new research that's about to be published um, does it offer a unique or unexpected perspective and the other one is does it offer a practical solution to everyday life challenges so some example, the last example of the last one is, you know, for example, um, should I, you know, should I get my child vaccinated once the vaccines come out? So in that case, we, you know, if you're a researcher who's doing that work, well, that's a perfect opportunity for us to publish something on that topic. All of our articles, um, we asked all of our researchers to come with evidence-based work so if, for example, you are somebody who wants to publish with us, we would ask that you bring your sources with us to your article. 
so that um, the editors can work with you. And we're not subject areas, we're journalists, we're experts in what we do, which is making a story um, accessible. So these are the writing tips. These are the things that you guys already know. You'll be writing for a general audience. So we, we ask that the, the prose is conversational. It's free of jargon. Um, that does not mean that we simplify to the point that we are dumbing down your research. We really wanna make sure that all of the complicated parts of your research are there, that the comp that we're translate, we're actually truly translating your research to a general audience. And the way that we often talk about that is, um, are you writing for somebody who is a first year student? Are you presenting a lecture to a first year student? Are you, um, but not a first year student in your field? Perhaps that you you are in sociology and your first year student is. Um, I don't know, a mathematics student. So these are the, I've, I've talked about how all of your information needs to be cited. We don't use footnotes or bibliographies. We use hyperlinks for that, but we do embed the sources within each article. So two questions that we asked you to think about when you're sending a pitch to us. Okay, can you talk about your story in one sentence? My story is about this. I'm gonna draw on this research to talk about this. I study, um, I study, um, I'm not sure I'm saying, I study uh, the business of sports and so I want to talk about the importance of women's hockey. Why is it interesting and significant for non-academic readers? Uh, guys, this is my new podcast. I have to make my pitch. Today is episode 12. Um, we just put it out and the, you know, the, the difference in, um, so for a three and a half or four years, I basically published five articles every week by researchers. And I wanna emphasize that those five articles were not done in a day. So even though I published an article a day, those articles sometimes take three weeks to finesse and get, get out. We want to make sure that the articles and the information that we're putting out is is correct and um, ha it goes out with integrity. So we take our time when we put those articles out there. But the podcast has a whole completely different um, feeling to it in that it, I take three weeks with, with a topic, go deep dive and research it, and then speak with two researchers from two different areas. Okay, now I really wanna ask, I really wanna take questions because I know that this is the most important time for you guys. Send me your questions. Can we open up the floor so that I can answer some questions? Now let me get out of the screen share. Absolutely, yeah. uh, thanks so much Benita for your insights and um, also the, your guidance for how to contribute to the conversation. And also thank you to all the panelists today. Um, these were some really interesting presentations with a lot of food for thought. Um, one of the threads that I noticed going across um, the three presentations was a real focus on collaboration and relationship building as being key to research impact, um, whether that was talking about it in terms of a shared space with Connie, um, with critical community engaged scholarship with Liz Jackson. Um, and I love the way you, you talked about academic it's not an academic methodol uh, academic invention, it's an academic methodology. I thought that was a really helpful nuance there. Um, and just this process of collaborating, whether it's with communities, stakeholders, or even editors, as, as you mentioned as well, Vinita. Um, and I'd like to also thank everyone who's been submitting and voting on questions. Um, really great to see all the engagement there. Um, I'm going to take a question from the floor as we're nearing time, um, but 
just a note that we will be sharing the recordings. Um, so you will have a chance to uh, revisit this conversation. So uh, first off, we have a question for Benita from Sandra Jeppesen. Uh, are there strategies for trying to figure out what is interesting in our research to an outside audience? Sometimes I'm so deep in it, I find it difficult to see from the outside. It is hard. It's, it is really challenging. Um, the, one of the things that sometimes happens is we get pitches and then um, get into a conversation with that scholar and hear a little bit more about what they're doing. And then I think by starting the, you know, by starting the conversation, meaning start your pitch, um, then you can open up a dialogue with the editor who can help kind of guide your ideas through. So just to think of it as a collaboration, um, but start the pitch. Uh, so I think, again, one of the ways is to, to, you know, to stay on top of or as you are listening to the news or as you're reading the news to start jotting down ideas like I have something to say about that um, and then start to make your pitches that way. And again, these are not op-eds. So to make sure that you do have evidence-based research to back up your idea. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you, Vinita. Um, there, is, there is one question that I will uh, just raise to the group. Um, given the import, this is from Kristen Burasa. Um, and thank you, Connie and Liz, for adding in your responses to these questions from the audience as well. I'm sure this is just the start of some conversations. Um, so from Kristen, given the importance of this kind of work, I wonder what advice you might have for universities, funders, and policymakers about valuing this kind of knowledge mobilization and impact work when it comes to things like university rankings, which tend to focus on grant dollars and citations. And I imagine a lot of early career researchers and graduate students would be um, thinking about this at the moment. So uh, Connie, I don't know if you want to uh, raise your answer at the floor, that would be very helpful. Sure, absolutely. Um, it's definitely a topic that comes up during our RIC, like monthly member discussion clubs all the time. Um, so I like, uh, David Phipps, the network director of research at Canada, and the person I mentioned, who's the assistant vice president of um, research impact and strategy at York, he wrote a blog post actually kind of around this topic um, because it's, I mean, we framed it as tenure and promotion, but it's kind of the same question, right? Like, how can we make like academics value knowledgeization work and engage scholarship work in a way, in the same way they might value like impact factors or journals or university rankings or whatnot. So I don't have like, here's the perfect advice to do that. I certainly don't know it, um, but we do have a couple of resources that are linked in this blog post that I've also put in the answer section of the Zoom chat that I welcome for people to check out. And uh, Kristen had a follow-up question about like specifically indicators at an institutional level. And I've linked two other resources that we've done um, this is mostly catered to an academic post-secondary institution. And so, um, but some of the indicators that some of these organizations, some of these institutions had used kind of on an institutional level, not as an individual researcher. Wonderful. Thank you, Connie. Uh, Liz or Vinita, did either of you want to jump in on this question? I, I wouldn't mind. <laughs> um, I... At, at Guelph, where I'm based, um, there was quite a concerted effort by the previous director of, of the unit that I now direct, um, a group of faculty associates, some education developers, and then some external experts on community engaged uh, teaching and research. And it did have actual results in terms of changing the ways in which faculty members tenure and promotion files were structured and were evaluated. So I don't think it solved the, old, the whole problem, but there is now space ink and and weight given to engaged activities that wasn't formerly there so that was probably mm, 12 years ago i would say uh the the journey is far from over i would also suggest at a different in a slower path maybe that another way in which i think that our our college of social and applied human, human sciences and the college of arts at guelph are making visible the value of engaged work is by um, each one has recently launched um, a new interdisciplinary graduate studies program. So in the arts, there's an MA PhD and in CSAWS, the social and applied human scientists, there's a PhD program that are both explicitly uh, practitioner based, engaged and seeking direct, um, 
hate this, but real world impact. Um, I'm sorry, Connie, I know you're probably cringing when I say that, but you know what I mean, right? So they're, they're both aimed at people with existing practices, existing relationships to communities, and that work is being valued, integrated, and supported as academic um, work in a way that I think often a student has trouble finding a, a supervisor to do an engaged project with. Um, so it's now built in structurally, valued at the institution, resources are flowing to it. Ideally, one day hires will be allocated to it. So I do feel quite hopeful in, in, in the long view. And I also think that a little more cynically, and then I'll stop, not cynically, um, practically, you know, we have funding bodies now, including SHRC and NSERC, that are explicitly asking people to do engaged work. Now that happens well and poorly, but it's valued and funded in a very, at a very high level. So knowing that, that funders are encouraging engaged work for whatever reasons of their own, I think can enable researchers, um, including student research, researchers, to keep moving up that path, you know, getting grants, being visible, publishing, um, and having that kind of work valued differently than maybe it would have been 10 or 20 years ago. Stop there. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Uh, Vinita, did you have a perspective on this from your work on Conversation Canada? Um, no, sorry, you gotta tell, you gotta remind, re rewind, tell me what, tell me what we're <laughs> no, no, absolutely. That's okay. Um, we have time for one more question. Um, so I will, um, it's actually directed to you, Vinita. Um, and this is from Crystal Shore. Uh, my question is for Vinita, what are some of the most common mistakes that scholars make when pitching an article to the Conversation Canada? And I think well, this I, would be a great place to end. Yeah, I think some of the most, I mean, the most common mistakes are that uh, when pitching, people forget to connect their research to their idea. So they say they have an idea and they forget to, you know, source it, like, and remind the editor that they have the expertise to talk about this. So that's one thing. And then the other thing is the, the mistake is to think of it as an op-ed. Like I have, I have this, this is driving me crazy. I really want to talk about this thing. Well, you know what? Everybody wants to talk about this thing right now, but tell me why you're the right person to talk about this thing and why you're going to talk about it in an evidence-based way, you know, so that, so that our readers can trust it. That's excellent. And thank you, Vanita. And unfortunately, that's all the questions we have time for today. Um, just looking at the clock here, um, but I wanted to thank all of you again um, for sharing your thought-provoking perspectives on building research impact. I really, really appreciate the conversation today. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, University Affairs, for their support of this webinar and Career Corner series. And if you'd like to revisit this conversation, uh, do keep an eye on your inbox because we're going to be uh, sending a link to the recording and other resources in the next few days. Um, so do watch out for that. And as we close out the webinar, I'd like to thank all of you for coming and bringing such excellent and insightful questions. Uh, have a wonderful afternoon.